And now, weighing in out of the blue corner, Josh the Pong Thompson. 100% agree. And on the other mic, he weighs in from the red corner, Big John McCarthy. Well, now we are lucky enough to have a living legend, a Hall of Famer, a guy that I met back in 1999 when he had his first fight in the UFC against, it was, what I want to say, Alfie Alcarez. Yes. Yeah. And you were fighting for Team Shamrock 2000. <laughs> I forget nothing. Yeah. My Holy man, Jens Pulver, how are you doing? Hall of Famer, a guy that is just Man, you don't age. Look at you. You still uh, got that. You're ready to go. I can see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got up. That's the best part. No, I'm doing great. You know, now here's the, you know, I know one of us older and I was having this conversation, Josh, yeah. when is the first time? Okay. Well, at least what I heard of you was we were just talking about this 19, man, it had to be 97, 97, 98, sometime around there. You and I were supposed to fight a couple times. Well, that's because you smashed the local, the local bad boy. Uh huh. You, he wasn't a wrestler, so he, he didn't count in our world. But he did the martial arts. <laughs> this is true. Stuff like the very yeah. true man. He wasn't part of BSU wrestling or anything like that. But he, uh, I remember hearing this fight. And supposedly you were from Stanford. That's all I remember. Like, oh, nah. this wrestler from Stanford. That's what yeah. I, but I'm telling you. What they said. He goes. He just smashed this kid, Brandon Shuey. And they're like, that was the big. Oh, this kid's coming for you. I was like, yeah. and I was a kid, you know, they're like, oh yeah, this kid, he wrestled from Stanford. His name was Josh and he just destroyed Shuey. And at some point somebody could like, I was disgusted. I even thought he and I were on a level. Like, yeah. Okay. Whatever. But you know, you had to go out there and you exposed this individual. Yeah. So like I said, I've known, I've known you for a long, long, long time. Yeah. We were supposed to fight. A long time. A couple times we were supposed to fight in the Boise area because yeah. that's where Mike Kyle was around that. He came from that yeah. area, played yeah. ball there. Um, yeah, I wrestled at North Idaho College up in Coeur d'Alene. I was okay. from the Bay Area, came back down. And when I came back down to train with Frank Shamrock, I was wrestling with the guys out of Stanford. You know, Todd Sermon, who passed away on the year 2000 in the millennium uh, in Vegas. He's the one that grabbed the fire. Bo Weiner was an All-American out of there as well. Grab trained with Zach line. Zimmer and those guys. A lot of these guys that came out of Stanford, I was there wrestling, you know, Getting some wrestling in with them. Trained me. I, I was up at North Idaho College with Trevor Prangley. We yep. wrestled there together. Um, you know, we had a lot of good, man, a lot of good wrestlers in the areas of where I was at. And so I had a lot of good work with them. But you, training with you, or not training with you, but getting ready to fight with you. People were trying to get us booked for so long. Yes. And then you took the UFC fight. And I was like, I'm never going to see that guy again. I forgot about you. As soon as you went to the UFC, I was like, he's done. I, there's no <laughs> way I'm going to ever get a fight with him. Yeah. And so these guys kept saying, we're going to book it. We're going to book it. Jen says he'll do it. We're going to book it. And uh, I remember the Shuey fight because Brandon was, you know, and, and I thought he was, he was a nice guy, but he was tapping everyone with hill hooks, yep. you know, and he was, he was getting everybody with hill hooks and reverse hill hooks. And, and so when I came out, I was like, just keep my ankles away from him and we're good to go. And man, I was able to get it out of there in about two and a half minutes. You know, you rolled him up to the point that everybody started talking about you after like, oh, and they were coming to me. Yeah. Oh, there's this kid. This kid, he's the one. He's wrestled from Stanford. Oh, this Josh, he's the Dude, one. Dude, you're like Neo. You're yeah. the oh, one. I'm well, you know. You, they were like, he's the one that's going to beat you. Because I was, I was smashing everybody around there at that point. You know, me and Eric Hines and uh -huh. all the BSU wrestlers. I was smashing. Well, like, oh, this kid. You know, I was like, oh, they, I'll get what, out of here. What catapulted, <laughs> what catapulted me in that whole Boise area was the Brandon Shuey thing, though, too. But what it was was this. Is I fought Carl Zamora and knocked him out in seven seconds with a head kick. Oh, that, that's so what it you, was. You the and old he, school, he was the wrestler. At BSU. Yeah, he was the wrestler. He was, from older, Boise yeah. State. He was all yeah. American, too. Yeah. And so that was like a set. We came out, touched gloves, a couple seconds, a little switch kick right to the head. He fell back into the ropes, hit him a couple times, out, ref stop, seven seconds. Yes, and that was that's, that's kind of when all the buzz was like, oh, Jens, and <laughs> Jens, and I was like, you know, you had to hear it too. They're like, uh, we've got this local kid that, yeah, oh, yeah, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were already putting us together. Yeah, they 100%. were trying their best, man. They were trying their best, but then I also knew too that no one had the money to do it. 
Yeah. I mean, they were, you know, that was, that was making 300 and 500 dollars at the time to fight. I I'm was like, fighting for videotape. I didn't, do, <laughs> I, I was fighting for free, man. Was, I was setting up fights in the old BSU gym. Oh, rude people business. People would show up and I would just beat them up. I was fighting for videotape. Jeez. Like I said, I, I tell people the story that I did one. I had one of my wrestling buddies was filming us. He had to lob that camera up on the shoulder and look through the one eye and yeah. he's trying to watch it. And he was so zoomed in. All you see are two pairs of shorts. <laughs> and I'm watching the video after I'm going, what? No. I'm like, why were you so zoomed? He goes, I couldn't tell. I couldn't see what I was doing. Yeah. So I had to set the ring up again the next week and bring someone else in and beat them up. I'm like, yeah. hey, you want to fight? Yeah, let's go. But I always stayed away from Shuey and, and that group over there in Nampa because they were kind of, they did the little Gracie train and yeah. they did all this stuff. I'm like, all yeah. right. And so when he stepped up and fought you, yeah, when you smashed him, I was like, "Oh, all right, this is so yeah." yeah we go back a long ways. We long do, ways. we do. I mean, the, I know it was it was supposed to happen a couple of times, and then when you went to the UFC, and I was like, "No, oh, he's gone." And then literally, like after you went to the UFC, I think like a year, year and a half later, I see you knock out um, uh, uh, John, John Lewis. Lewis. John, Lewis, and I'm like, yeah. "All right, I'm this I, unless I get to the UFC, this guy ain't never coming back. He, we ain't fighting local stuff no more for him." Yeah, so. Well, that I was, went and did that fight in the Boston Invitational, and that was mm -hmm. that Lowell Anderson was yeah. the the black belt from Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Like he actually did those Indoors. challenges and stuff. Yeah, yeah. he was. No, he was tough. And, yeah, and he Lowell was uh, the guy I trained with a, a bunch. He was. A oh, good are you guy. serious? Yeah, yeah. I, was, I went up to train with him for like a week, and like, yeah, we're gonna go to this Boston Invitational over here in uh, Colorado, Bright Littleton. Colorado, I believe, right after that big the, the school shooting happened. I remember uh, that um, that school shooting happened because all the news and everything was there that same weekend when we showed up. It had just happened. Yeah, and um, um, Columbine, right? I believe yeah. Columbine was the school, and I'll never forget that. So now here we're doing this this outlawed show at this martial arts center. It was the Boss Suit and Invitational. John Peretti, who was the uh, UFC. The matchmaker rep, the for matchmaker for the UFC. And so he was refereeing these fights. And I remember I had to fight at 170. Nah. And I thought, all right, let's, yeah, let's dive in. And I remember the first time, it's crazy. You had to open hand strike. Um, it was, it was like Ben Grace. Yeah, yeah, but you could knee him right just in the eye socket. You could, <laughs> everything else was going, but as long as the hands were open in, in, on, on the ground. Yeah. And it was free and no time limit. Yeah. And I do remember I fought this kid, David Harris, in the finals the first time around. I beat him for 20 some minutes. I threw him everywhere. I mean, I'm lobbing him. Just, uh, I'm trying, but I can't put him away. All of a sudden, I remember he goes down towards my foot and I'm thinking, you're never taking me down. Good luck. And he grabs my foot and just uh, wrenches it. Poo, and it snapped and popped like what the and i yeah. fell over and i tapped and heel hooks like what what is this yeah i didn't know i didn't know such things you know no and, and that, that was my concern because i had seen the whole gracie train with brandon shuey he had fought another kid that uh he was like the main event on this other show that one of my buddies they went down do and magical fought. stuff man yeah, yeah they could and then, <laughs> and then once we realized all you gotta do is just sprawl and brawl they had no answer for it yeah, we fixed 100%. the gracie jiu-jitsu stuff up real quick it was quick uh, and easy no <laughs> it was Oh man, but no, it was uh definitely um it was definitely uh I wouldn't say strange times. It was fun times. Yeah. Back then. I mean, yeah. like like I said, we the the day and age of like calling people on the phone and and now with the cell phones right everywhere going, "Hey, you know, I've got a fight here and there." They had to call the local gym. And then yeah. you call the local gym, "Hey, do you have any fighters of this weight class?" And then you guys would all, "We're having a fight at the Boise Fairgrounds." Okay, be here at this time for weigh-ins. <laughs> like, and you really had no way of getting a hold of the person unless they were at home answering their phone. And going, hey, yeah, you're going to be here. We're going to fight at this time. Weigh-ins are here at this time. So a lot of for us was to to show up, make sure that we had we got our money of 150 bucks or 300 dollars, whatever bucks. it was. Yeah, you know. And uh, man, but I made I was able I was very fortunate to make a good name for me and myself in the in the Idaho, Oregon, Washington area. Because for a little bit there, when I wasn't able to get signed to the UFC just yet, and I wasn't able to stay active, Boise would pay me three to third, usually three grand to thirty five hundred dollars to fight, and I got signed wow. to the UFC making two and two. So I was going to fight in the UFC making two and two, and this brings me back to the Jeremy Horn days. He's like, "Why would I go back to the UFC when I can fight every other weekend against guys that are nowhere near my level and make twice as much money than taking one hard fight against someone like a a Chuck Liddell or?" you know, or a solo ev or whoever, you know what I mean? Like, why yeah. would I fight that fight when I yeah. could fight Joe Blow off a of bar stool? Yeah. I mean, what was the most you made outside of the UFC? 
My farm needs the earth, the air, and the water. I get my energy going on Element Electrolyte Drink Mix. Clean, good tasting energy that feeds me like I feed my plants and animals. And after a long day on the tractor, when it's time to shoot the podcast, I drink Element so that I can stay energized and stay salty. Let's get it on. Oh, I don't even know. Nothing, nothing big at all. I never made, I never, I made enough to stay alive and keep the, you know, yeah. and keep the, keep the lights on and stuff like that. I don't know if maybe because just because I was small or something like that, but there was never, I never made big, big money in that aspect ever. I, I don't know, maybe just my time, maybe it's just, you know, like I said, the sport was growing, whatever it was. But again, was. I went from fighting for free. Yeah. So it was just do what I can. And I, you know, I learned a lot. Especially the Jeremy, like you said, it's funny you said about Jeremy Horn. He showed me, and you know, he would fight every weekend. Yep. And he'd be, you know, for this much or this much, but he was he was staying busy. And that was one thing, like, I was able to fight. The UFC was only, what did they do, six shows a year? Six John, or seven shows like a year. Seven yep. shows a year. And, but you were so, fighting outside of it. You were, you were fighting. You, we in, got to fight outside, yeah. So you I got fought lucky. the WEF against, yeah. like, Phil Johns after you had your uh, And UFC then Dean Thomas, who smashed my ankle, which made the <laughs> whole story going into fighting John Lewis even better, but yeah, was, yep. you know, Dean guy, Dean gave me a beat, and that's I, I popped in. I think he was talking to Dean. So yeah, yeah, we were talking were, to Dean. I, yeah, I, yeah. And, uh, just... He rolled and hit me again. That damn heel hook. I learned it twice. I'm like, God, <laughs> these things were just. Well, but he rolled through it and smashed me. Holy, you were training with guys like Jeremy Horn. You were supposed to learn those things. I like, know. But... After after you, like I said, you, your opening fight in the UFC was it was a draw. Yeah. against Alfie Alcaraz, which I refereed, which was a great... I mean, you guys were just slinging leather yeah. the entire time. I think it's the only guy that I ever saw in the UFC that was smaller than you, though. Yeah. Okay, as far as true. in the lightweight division. Yeah, very true. You know, Alfie, very was, true. Alfie was you know, not big in stature or anything like that. But you were fighting for Shamrock 2000. Bob Shamrock had a yeah. team because he kind of was upset with... But from that point, you left and went to Militich Fighting Systems. You met Pat Militich and... Yeah. He all of a sudden you were out in Iowa and you were part of his team. And that team that you were part of was had an amazing run. Yeah. You take a look at what you did, what Matt Hughes did, yeah. you look at Tim Sylvia, just I mean, an incredible run. Pat himself. What was it like being at Militich Fighting Systems during that time for you? You know, it was uh it was a time of my life, just a whole bunch of it was Everybody just got together. I rem I'll never forget this. When I first showed up, because that was the thing about being down at Shamrock, is everybody showed up at the end. Like, they would show up after work. Everybody still had jobs. Everybody, you know, they started to do their thing. They wouldn't make it. It was a hobby. And so I sat around all day, just kind of, well, what am I going to do with myself? I just graduated college, you know, and I want to train all day. I had that wrestling attitude where we trained in the morning. We went to classes. We trained in the afternoon, you know. And so I was always trying to figure out, okay, well, what am I going to do? So I didn't have anything, you know, I didn't have that. And I can get into the Nick Diaz story in a minute, but that's how I met Nick was this one kid would always show up to train. And, you know, I'm like, don't you guys go? Yeah, I'm on break and stuff like that. Well, I remember later on in the UFC, Hey, you remember me? It's me, Nick Diaz. Like, Oh, I, that's how long I've known Nick. He was hanging out that wow. gym and I was kind of by myself. And even he remembers there was a time I was like, I think I made a mistake. And, and and he he brought this up to me one time. He's like, you were you were kind of gutted. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do because it just wasn't this wasn't was I, that I what I was expecting. And so after that first fight, I met Pat and them, and I told Bob, I go, hey, I'm going to go back up to Boise because I'm used to training all day long, and I'm just going to work out up there for a while. So now everything I owned is in a is at Bob's house. I go up with just two duffel bags, go back to um, Idaho, start training, and then I get a call, hey. I talked to Monty Cox and Pat Militich and they would love to have it. Cause I met him. Like I said, I got to meet him. We did that UFC 22. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I thought the world, I, here comes Pat Militich. He's the champ. And Jeremy Horn, I'm like, Oh, it's Jeremy Horn. I didn't know Matt. He was at the time, but that was the first time looking at him. You know, I was like, all right, you know, so that's how I met him. But I just remember when he said, Hey, they want you to go out there. I'm like what? But I just moved down to you. He's like, well, you know, there's really nothing here for you. So now mm -hmm. here I am on a train two and a half, you know, two bags and two and a half days later, I show up and I'm ready. And I'll never forget when I got there and I showed up for the morning practice and there was just drill. Everybody was in there training, practicing drill. I'm like, 
what? Like, and don't then you dudes back, have jobs? Right. And they're like, no, they didn't. It was a big clubhouse. I'm like, didn't. what? You know, <laughs> this was their job. I go, no way. And so then, you know, and they were all, and I remember reading on the Ultimate Fighter. Because yeah, what was that? Oh, the uh, the paper, the full contact fighter, the newspaper. Yeah. I was gonna say the ultimate fighter. The, that wasn't yeah, even close to the yeah. ultimate fighter back then. The the, the full contact full fighter, contact that was fighter the Joel Gold. Joel Gold. And every weekend, I remember reading and seeing, man, all these guys coming from Extreme Challenge. They're all getting into the UFC. I gotta, I gotta go out here and do this. I'm, yeah. Like, and so when I showed up and I see this mecca of everybody just training, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm in heaven. I'm in. Yeah. And so it was, yeah, I loved it. And then, you know, we always talk about the infamous sparring days. At that time, I think the biggest thing people needed more than anything was conditioning and toughness. Mm-hmm. Later on, skills and stuff we've learned, but conditioning and toughness, and boy, we we I think we mastered that. You but mastered we, it, but you also broke a lot of people. <laughs> we, beat, we beat each other up bad. There were stories we have sent. We sent people home. I, there were a couple of people. They left a note on a, one. Wrote, left a note on the plate. This isn't for me. <laughs> stuff up and off he went. And we'd have challenges. People would come in, and I've been challenged. I think two or three times. I had people come in, and you know, and. Because Monty had these Tuesday night fights, which helped a lot. Now that I think about it, it helped out more than anything. And they were just boxing, you know, like that tough man, the yeah. smoker style. And we would just show up. So it was like, okay, free. we'd get done with practice and we'd go out there and just to be able to, you fight an unfamiliar face, you know, you're going against an unfamiliar face with the crowd. All of a sudden there's that accountability. It's like, okay, this gets real. This gets, fa- you know, this is, this gets real, real quick. And it was only punching. So it's to help us work on our hands and stuff like that. Well, I remember I fought this kid, I'd be boom, boom. And I put him right through the ropes and his friend gets up. He was getting all salty. And he's like, man, he started doing, I go, whoa, hey, hey, I'm boxing you, buddy. I go, but you, I go, I'll peel these off. We can do this right now. I go, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll smash you. <laughs> this he says, is- I'll never forget this. He goes, he goes, yeah. He goes, man, I want, I'm going to teach you a lesson. I go, yeah. And he starts yelling at Pat. Pat goes, hey, just show up on Wednesday, seven o'clock. All you got to do is show up. And I'm like, he goes, oh, I'm going to teach your boy a lesson. So mm. I was sitting there and sure as shit, after the entire practice, we usually go from seven to eight live sparring. And then from eight to nine, we're grappling and, you know, we'll go past it. And just as everybody was finishing, just as everybody was finishing, he shows up, you know, and he's like, oh, I'm here. I'm like, well, he showed up at the end, but you know, I think I was 15 rounds in I'm like, yeah, I'm in. So here's the beautiful thing about it. We we're in a racquetball court. You know how the racquetball court is? You can sit up top and look down yeah. yep. and watch. Oh, so everybody, so he goes, all right, well, we're not going to start grappling. It's not. And there's only one enough. door to get in and out and of. There's only one, and it's a tiny <laughs> little door. The Tim yeah. Sylvia hated that door. But, um, <laughs> and I remember Pat trying to climb the uh, for his birthday in the pink belly. But, so, um, so he's like, all right, we're going to do three rounds and uh, we'll let you guys, we'll settle this. So I, I, I'm like out of a movie. I'm like, are you kidding me? It's like Lionheart with, with Jean-Claude yeah. Van Damme. We're setting up this little, we're in this little racquetball court. And I remember just going out there, boom, boom, boom. boom. And it's kind of beating on for a minute. And I'm thinking, all right, you know, I step back and I let him hit me with the right hand. And I looked at him and I go, if that's all you got, I'm like, this is going to hurt. And I just start, <laughs> boom, 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 ripping with liver shots down. He goes, get up, man. This is your time, man. You know, this is your dime. You this is do your this. moment. Yeah, this is your moment. Let's do it. And he gets back up and boom, up, down he goes again. And then he goes, and then he starts breathing. He goes, all right, time, time. And he starts to ask for a minute and a half go, rounds. He goes, minute and a half time. rounds? What do you mean? <laughs> he was going three minute rounds. You better get out of here. You're supposed to teach me a lesson. Uh-huh. And I <laughs> No, he got mudded and he had to go out that little hole. He had to crawl, he had to crawl out the <laughs> door. He started practice and back in oh, we went. So now oh, this I had it happen a few times. Yeah, but he, That's crazy. yeah, he was going to teach me a lesson. But like I said, it was really cool to be able to just have that live situation like that. And so we learned a lot. It was funny because Matt, we're like, dang it, Matt, stop wrestling. You got it. You got to work on hands. You know how he liked it. He would just press you. And he yeah. just press you up against the you know, against the ring and just start bunch of like, no, you're supposed to work on your hands. And we just, you know, like I couldn't, I can't help it. So it's yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. We were ahead of the time, but you know, training out there was it was it was heaven. And again, the one of the biggest things we always took pride in, there were people that nobody really heard of that were so good. Again, always being an extreme challenge. Jason Black is one I Jason was tough I as do hell. remember Jason Black. Jason looked you know. like Abraham Lincoln, man. <laughs> I, <laughs> I do remember, remember when Jason I moved Black. There and, and Monty goes, hey, this is going to be your roommate. And I go, huh? Welcome back, Cotter. I'm like, what? He had this <laughs> big afro and, and he had this ACDC shirt with the sleeves cut off. And I'm thinking... 
He didn't have an ounce of fat on him. Ever. No, no. He just, he looked like a, he, I'm going, you want me to live with this guy? Yeah. I'm going, I'm intimidated by no emotions. Not then yeah. he just grumbled and growled. And yeah. then, but when I got to talking to him, we all, oh, man, he became one of my, he's like my, one of my best friends on the planet. But at the time I'm thinking, I'm going to move in with this kid. Yeah. Like, good. Look, this is terrible. Can't I just stay with you, Monty? I want to live here. You know, like, <laughs> it's safer here. I was afraid of him, man. Yeah. Black was, he was saying, hey, man, of course, man, here with him. Go ahead. Let me ask you this because this, this is unusual. And it, it was part of what you guys had as a group. Just the whole thing with Militich. Monty Cox was your manager. I talked to him yesterday. Okay? <laughs> I talked to Monty all the time. He's losing weight. He's oh, lost you 80 see pounds. That? Oh, He's lost 80 boy, I gotta pounds. I got to look at him. Holy Dude, God. I couldn't believe it. I said, because he said he, 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 tried, he tried to say something about, man, he says, my head shrink. And I said, well, there wasn't anything in it anyway, so it could go down even further. <laughs> but <clears throat> he signed you with a handshake. Yep. You guys shaked hands. There was no contract. He was your manager. He, he, this was the amount. This is what he was going to do for you. And it worked. Yeah. It's amazing when you think about it. Yeah. I just, well, and there were two, there were situations where, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I'll, yeah, I'll never forget, you know, when the UFC and we were doing, and, and when I lost my belt and it was just, it was a contract negotiation. But at the time, you know, Dana's like, you're really going to regret this. And I go, look, I'm, 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 I'm not shitting on the UFC. I love the UFC, but I yeah. truly do believe that I'm the best lightweight and I should be, I, I just, I want to be paid by $5, mm -hmm. just make me the highest paid lightweight by $5. Because I was on the old SEG contract yeah. before this contract. And, you know, and, and, and he goes, you know, the loyalty thing. And I said, you know, the only problem is there's what he goes, you're really going to regret this. You should stay loyal with us. And I go, I am loyal to you. I'm a hundred percent loyal. They go, the only downfall is there's just one person that's in front of you, Monty. Which and made go, Dana that's when I, hate Monty. <laughs> I know, but that's but that's when I stuck because that's the first commitment that I made was to him, and then everything else was kind of secondary. Same thing with Brian Butler. I love Butler. I loved him more than anything. I brought him in, you know. But I was like, he had to just be like an. I brought him in to be like an agent or, or a marketer. I guess would be the right word. A marketer, like to get you know sponsors up because Monty yeah. didn't do that. And every I had every in hindsight, I should have left Monty probably right about. I don't, at least at that moment, I probably should have. And I, I think I made, and for me, I made, I feel like I should have, I should have stuck with Butler because I'm the one who brought him into it. Mm -hmm. He was everything that I wanted. And I felt horrible about that. But it, again, push kind of came to shove. And I was like, you know, the problem is I made I, as much as I love him, man. I, I made this promise to Monty and, mm -hmm. you know, and the way that the thing that, Stuck with me more than anything. And I still talk to his kids every day. I'll never forget what Monty said when I first was staying. I lived there for probably the first three weeks and tried to get out. He's like, you know, the problem is you can't stay here for very long because my kids, they'll get attached to you. And mm. then, you know, and what will happen is they start getting attached and then you'll, you'll take off and you won't be around. And they're going to think, well, what did I do wrong? What did I do? That's why I don't let anybody ever stay at my house or like that. My kids start getting attached. And I said, you know, I, 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 I get that. I get what you're saying, but, just on a short, I'm making short with it, but I've been friends with them to this day. I love those kids. I talked to them. They've grown and, you know, but oh, yeah. Monty was, and my point was I had this load because he, this guy let me stay in his house. He let me yeah. around his, he trusted me enough to be around his family. And, you know, if it wasn't for him, I'd have never got started. Nobody would know who I was. I wouldn't have been, you know, I mean, who knows, you know, and that's why Josh, I commend you because you made it coming out of that Northwest coming out of Idaho. But for me, I was like, you know, I, I just, the way the path took me and how mm -hmm. my journey ended up being in Iowa. And so there was just, that was my number one promise. That was my first ever handshake. And to me, that's all it took. No but, contract, nothing was needed. Let me, I, I know how much you made for that BJ Penn championship fight. Don't even want to talk about it. Okay. Then <laughs> I'm not going to say it because it's numbers understandable. Don't, numbers don't. Yeah. We don't do numbers. Yeah, it, it's understandable. <laughs> why you gave up the belt and said, Hey, I, I got to go make money because at, but at the time the UFC was, they were, they were hemorrhaging money. It, it's a hard situation. Well, then they were, sides. and it was, and it, it really was. And I have to cut you off. They, they, it was. And I was like, you know, because again, it was just one of those things where he said, just get through this contract and, and, and we'll take, and, and we'll take care of you. But this was because the best time of your career. So it's tough for you. 
Yeah. Well, long, that and I, I hadn't mean, even had a contract with you. I was still on that SEG contract, yeah. and I and I finished. You know what I mean? And so, but that was kind of one, and that was where it kind of got me because he kept putting in my head, "You just stick with us, stick through this, stick through this." You know, and I'm fighting Dennis Hallman and at the time. I don't think people truly appreciate just how tough Dennis Hallman was, especially with someone like me who don't like legs, but his guillotine was through the roof. And the fact that he submitted Matt Hughes twice, twice. in under 20 seconds, and he had the mind bullet, Matt Hume, as his, <laughs> as his, coach. you know, as his coach, which yeah. was horrifying to me. And that was, there's, okay, see, we could really go back. That's the other reason why I left Seattle was because of Dennis Hallman. He's the whole reason why I wouldn't go train with Matt Hume and why I left Seattle and we didn't go back home. I'm from Seattle and in all rights, I should have been right there. I should have went to Demetrius Johnson with DJ, but it was Dennis Hallman and that mother. He, so I went to <laughs> Iowa. So in a way, if it wasn't for him, because I'm, I'm jumping around, but we, we were in the same league together, wrestling, high school, and he taunted me and threw all this shit in my face. You'll never be like, oh, you're trying to be a fighter. You're never going to be like – when I was fighting in Idaho, Josh, when we were yeah. doing Boise and stuff, he was on the – what was the ultimate um, – what was the underground forum? Yep. That was where everything was. The yeah, that's where we, all, had, that's where we all made our everything fights. Everything was. Everything yeah. was made yep. through there. And he was just hounding me. You ain't never going to catch up that. You'll never be good. You Pete, you want to be in all this stuff. And I hated that. Stuff. He, he, was, he was the first Jake Paul before there was a Jake Paul. Oh yeah. man! Yeah, he, he was, was a, he's a Logan Paul and a Jake Paul. He would he if, if he would have came if influencers would have came around in that era he would have been the first guy. Yep. he was he that guy. In think, masks and stuff like he yeah. did all kinds of crazy things for his shows. Yeah. I would hear stories about the shows that he would do and stuff. And but he is the reason why I left and never went and trained with him because he trained there. Yeah. And I was like, I can't be around him because he won a yeah. state title. I think after I left, like after I graduated, he was a year younger than me. Mm -hmm. And so th this hatred to that dude. And next thing yeah. you know, here I am about to fight him. Oh, the mental games, the games, the yeah. games, especially <laughs> when he beat Matt twice. Oh, it was, it was, we, yeah, it was we couldn't stand each other either. Cause I beat one of his guys, Victor or something, Victor Gonzalez or Victor something. And I beat him twice and he freaking hated the fact that I beat his guy twice. He but I couldn't strong stand. armed all the Pacific Northwest. He strong yeah. armed everything. I'd hear stories about this. Yeah. He would I'm try, like, he would basically try and tell him like, Hey, you can't be on the car with me. He would try and do like, He would try to get me to fight him all the time. I was like, Hey, let's fight, you know, but they never came about. I wanted money. I'm like, Hey, you have to pay me a lot of money. He's yeah. He, he just was one of those guys. Like I said, he, if he would have came in the influencer in the influencer era, yeah, he would have been doing a lot better because he yeah. was that guy. I mean, yeah. think about his well, one of his last fights in the UFC was wearing the the tarantarans, right? He's the reason oh, why you can't wear the you, you can't, can't wear, wear them. The, yes, yeah. the reason yeah. why you the can't can, you, yeah you can't wear yeah. the speedo Ken Shamrocks anymore. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I mean, yeah, he he was uh, <laughs> but he let me give you a little story on him. He did a thing where Bob Cook was supposed to fight somebody. I think it was supposed to be Dennis Holman. Was supposed to fight him on on one of his shows up in Washington. They brought up Frank. They brought up uh, you know Bob, and they were all there. They put him in a hotel. What they did was ben, I think it was Benji Raddick. It was Dennis Holman. It was, uh, Victor. I think I think his last name was Gonzalez. I think. Anyways, Victor. The three of them. There's four of them. Whatever it was. They came. They knocked on Frank's door, and they what they'd done is they filled up a trash can, a big trash can full of water, leaned it against his door, oh. and they knocked on the door, and he opened it. And flooded his whole room, and fucking it, it yeah, it just it just fucked up. So what he did, Frank ran after them. They jumped out the window. They ran into their room. They ran into their room. He kicks their door down in their hotel room. They jump out the window. He fucking grabs all their shit in their hotel room. Their watches, their phones, everything. He grabs everything. This was like cell phones just started kind of coming about. He grabs their cell phones. He grabs their watches. He turns the water on in the hot tub and in, in the bathtub. Throws all their shit inside the fucking, <laughs> all of their shit in the tub. And then he just went back. He went about his business the next day. He's like, "Hey, what's going on, guys? How's everything going?" Like he saw him at the fights, acted like nothing was. And they were like, "Man, what'd you do? You cost you know you threw our watches, broke their watches, broke their phones, put it all in the in the in the tub." They were all pissed off. He's like, "Hey, whatever, guys. How's it going?" Like he just acted like nothing happened. But that's the kind of person that Dennis was. He would fuck with you when you bring you in for fights. He'd he'd fuck with you guys. I heard. You know? I heard there were some there were some clown shows, and it was it was impressive. So happened to fight him. That one really. That one. UFC really, thirty three. Yeah, mm. that one really had me. 
pissed. I was, <laughs> I was, I was pissed, man. It was, you know. Jens, do me a favor, man. Bring the mic a little bit more in front of your face because we're having a yeah. There you go. I'm sorry. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Um, but I'm yeah, getting away from it. <laughs> um, I mean, look, we're talking about your career. The after the BJ fight, understanding that everyone knew the buzz was that you wanted to make more money. You deserve to make more money. You just beat BJ. I remember because I trained with BJ at that time, leading up to that fight. We were like, man, Jen's not gonna be able to stop the jitsu. BJ's gonna be able to get him down. You know, BJ, we knew how good BJ was on the feet too, in terms of boxing. Oh yeah, and he had power. It wasn't it wasn't the best boxer, but he had power. Yeah, he so had I, hands. Yeah, and I was like thinking, man, like Jen's not gonna be able to stop the takedown if, against the fence. BJ was strong, and if he could get him down, BJ's jujitsu was phenomenal. I was all those things. And then after you beat him, though. Do you regret, though, then stepping away? I know we just kind of buzzed over the terms of like, hey, I should have maybe not stayed with Monty. This Hindsight. And that. Hindsight's in, 2020, baby. But in, it's actually 50-50, John. But <laughs> <laughs> I always say it. But when you you look back now on your My career, partner. I know it's easy to say like, ah, you know, but do you regret it at all? Because like you would have stayed in the UFC and all those guys that were there, you were already beaten. There was yeah. no one really else for you to beat anymore. Yeah. No, um... Well, yeah, I mean, it, damn, you guys didn't, okay, I don't, right. don't get emotional on me, man. I'm not going to get emotional. I'm not going <laughs> to get emotional. It's not emotional, but I always tell people I don't have, I don't have regrets because if any one thing in my life would change, I wouldn't be where I'm at right here, right now. Yeah. Doing the thing, you know, with my family, my kids, things I love and it, and I've, and I've held on to that. For a long time, but because, like I said, I run that, I run the streams and stuff for the UFC Fight Pass, and I always, I'm always talking with chat. You know, there are moments that, if, 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 you know, and I, I, I don't know if I could because it was that was just the situation. It's just knowing that these guys that I just beat are getting paid more than me, and that's why when I said after that, I go, well, and here is your belt. It's obvious you don't want me to be your champion. And I just beat your dude. Mm -hmm. I, I just beat your boy. I know BJ was the one you got. That was the one that he's the way he smashed everybody coming up. I mean, he beat Dean Thomas, you know, he, yeah. I mean, knocked him out, I believe. Yeah. Which, oh, and yeah. Then, he, then he beat oh, yeah. Joey Gilbert, who was one of my first roommates at Boise State University. He was one of the best wrestlers, I believe, from Michigan. And then he transferred over there. So he had beaten. Here he was. And I remember when and then he knocks out Uno in 33 seconds. 11, guy, 11, 11 seconds. 11, 11, 11 seconds. Faster yeah. than your knockout against John Lewis by four That seconds. was 11.5. <laughs> 11.5. It said 33. But, I, but the thing was, I was commentating that fight. Ah. And I remember saying, I go, oh, they're like, man, I don't look, I don't envy you, gents. I don't envy you at all. And I'm like, hey, he, Joe Silver sent me this piece of paper. He ain't evil. He ain't me. Mm. That's all I had. <laughs> at the time. But I'm not going to lie. I was sitting there just going, damn. Yeah. Holy cow. I, uh, you know, and then. um, Because you but, had, well, let's, let's put this. You had gotten, you were the first lightweight champion in the UFC by beating Cal Luno. It went yep. five rounds. It was a great yep. fight. Yeah. And that's and now I remember when they flew me over to Japan to watch him beat Ru Rumina Sato yeah. and defend his belt. Rumina, hands down, when it comes to submissions, there Crazy was nothing submission. like him. Yeah. As far as advanced as he was, I tell people to this day, you need to, you need to watch anything Rumina Sato, how fast this kid can transition from a flying arm bar into a knee bar into an ankle lock. It was just, it was, it was yeah. dumb. And for Uno to beat him, I'll never forget Dana looking right at me going, that's who you're going to fight for the first ever 155 pound title right there. He goes, cause when you're going to be the UFC champ, you're going to be considered the best on the planet. I'm like, oof. All right. I, this is about to get real, you know? And um, so, yeah. And here BJ, it just knocked him out and just blew through him. And I'm thinking, this is guy is supposed to be so good on the ground and he's knocking everybody out standing up. It's like, this is, this is going to be horrible, you know? And so <laughs> I just, gonna be horrible. <laughs> I, I, I really did. But, that at the time, it goes back to that first question you'd asked about what it was like training with the military crew. And at that time, I was like, you know, they don't, I don't, they don't, he doesn't have the strength of Matt Hughes. He's not as well rounded. He's not a Jeremy Horn. He can't kick like Pat Militich. And there's no way he's going to be in better shape than me because there's nobody pushing themselves harder. Aggressive, relentless attack all day, every day, you know. And um, so th that, that, that pushed me. But do I regret? You know, and then having beat him, I think I can't say 
I regret in one aspect that Dana took it that I didn't have loyalty to the UFC because that's not true. And I told, and I said, I go, because I was very loyal. I gave up everything <clears throat> to be in the UFC. Yeah. I moved. I, 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 I lost, I gave up everything to be a UFC fighter. I had a job. I graduated college. I was working at a high school. I was going to be the head wrestling coach. Mm-hmm. I was going to be, I had all these things. I had a future. My mother cried. When I told her what I was going to go do, she said, <laughs> what? She started crying. This thing's only, again, it's only legal in three States and they don't even have your damn weight class. And you're going to do what? I go, I'm, I got to go. And it was the principal. When I went and told her after that fight with Alfie Alcaraz, I go, I really want to do this. I really want to, I, I really want to be a world champion. We can get into the fact of how I grew up and I was beaten badly and made these promises and stuff, what I was going to become. But, and she said, I'll never forget it. She goes, Jens, she said, um, you know, life is short, but your athletic life is a sliver. Mm-hmm. You can always come back and talk to these kids because they'll always be this age and they'll always need guidance from people like you. So you should need to go out there. You need to fill your book. And I just looked dead at her and went, shook her hand, said, thank you very much. I'm, I'm gone. And I'm gone. So now to get all the way back to it. So I had all these things. So there's a point I was very loyal to the UFC. I was everything low, but I just felt like, and it, and it hurt me. I felt like they, it just, I, I, it, I tell people all the time for the first time. No, not the first time, probably the second or third time in my life, someone showed me my worth and my value and it gutted me. Mm. And that's, that's the hardest thing about this sport and things like oh, this it is. in the sports world and stuff like that is people they will show you their version of your worth and your value. And everybody likes to feel like there's sparkles and glitter and diamonds and gold. But when someone looks you dead in the eye and something that you choose to be, and you're the best in the world and you just defended it twice in a weight class that you created, you know what I mean? And and they say, no, this is, this is what you're worth. Mm -hmm. And it broke my heart. And after that, I was like, well, to hell with being, the most well-rounded fighter, the sprawling brawl king, the one that know he can beat. I go, the only thing that excites anybody is knockout. So I'm just going to go out there and just lay it on the line one way or the other. And if you notice, I pretty much stopped ground at, from that day forward, stopped takedowns, stopped ground and pound, mm. stopped and just started throwing punches because that's what everybody wanted. And that's, and that's what I gave him after that. I was like, it was the wild west to me. I didn't give, I, I just, I didn't care anymore. So do I regret it? I can't say that I regret it because just the crazy, the crazy turns and the, the way that my life is and the way that it's turned out. And then again, with the hall of fame and everything, the way that it's all turned out, like I always tell people, if, if any one thing in my life would have changed, I wouldn't be sitting right here right now. We're doing this interview with you guys. And you know, so no, I don't, I don't regret it. It's, it's, it's hard. Like, because I, I've been through this a couple of times. I actually was, I'm really close with Scott Coker and when I, I had, was dealing with, right after I won the title, we were trying to renegotiate my deal with Strikeforce. And I was, you know, talking about, you know, communicating with UFC. And it was like this, all of a sudden we weren't friends anymore. It was, it was a really weird feeling, a really weird, like, experience. I ended up signing back with Strikeforce. I enjoyed being there. I wanted to be there. They paid me well. But then the same thing, I went the same thing again when I left the UFC to go to Bellator. It was Coker again and just having the contracts and negotiations. It was like, sure, I got paid really well. But I was like, man, you're going through this feeling again of like you feel underappreciated. Knowing what some of these fighters are making. I mean, these guys now that are the top, that are in the top five, top 10. I mean, they're making quadruple what we were making at the time. These guys are making, you know, 80 and 80, you know, 120 to 120. Some guys making 200 and 200. I mean... That's a that was a ton of money to us back then. Like you said, seven shows in a year. Yeah, you only have seven shows in a year, and if you missed a fight because you were injured, they were already booked for the next show, so you had to wait two shows basically to get on that card. And so yeah, it was it was very slim pickings. We would try to fight whenever we could. It was definitely rough times. I do you feel a little animosity towards the new generation who's getting who's being lavished, you know, with all this this. They saw they fought in the sphere last weekend. I was the most amazing thing ever. I was doing a, <laughs> I was commentating and watching that online because I, I 
commentate for UFC Fight Pass. Okay. I, I do I do all the watch alongs. Um, okay. On, um, so Fridays I watch fights of fighters fighting. Saturdays fight Saturday I just do the watch along and hang out with chat. And I had TJ DeSantis, Pearl Gonzalez for the guests. I nice. uh, were my guests on that. One. Oh, I love it. Love everything about it. But that thing was it was nuts looking into just that. <laughs> and you knew he was going to go crazy with that. But just the videos and just how I mean it was amazing just to see that thing and the, and the stories behind it and that was being told and it's impressive but you know this is what i tell people all the time was you know there are plenty of people out there think about the nfl players back in the day when they started the leagues so what yeah. these what these quarterbacks and st- what these players are making now Jeez. and, and some of these quarterbacks there, aren't even good and they're still oh, making more can, than the best you can sit there and just get pissed off about well you know i should be getting this as you get that or you know i look what i did in the time that i had and what i did I created something. I pioneered a weight class. I was involved in a sport that I knew was going to explode. You know what I mean? I became the world champion. I, I defended it, which, you know, because some people, you, you got to deal with that. Whenever you're usually the first world champion, it's probably because the weight class was weak or, you know what I mean? There was not, because there's not much hype behind the weight classes and it could be pretty, you know what I mean? So there was mm-hmm. never too much thought about that first world champion until you look at, the people that I did fight and the people that I did. So there was, there was legitimacy to, you know, the, the being the champion. At they the validated you as their career went on and this, this sport carried on. They yeah. validated you yeah. guys like, you know, guys like uh, BJ Penn, they validated yeah. the fact that you were the champion. Yeah. You know, and that was, you know, and it was, and that was so, yeah, it just, you know, there's one thing stuck in my head to this day. And it's with you, Josh. And I don't want to bring it up. I'm not bringing it up because the outcome was, it was not in your favor, but wow. I got to know if you remember this when you were fighting Eves Edwards. Do you remember taunting me? Do you yes, remember looking does. at me, messing with me? And I'm like, you better pay attention to this fight in front of you because you were like, Ooh. I win this fight. I'm fighting you. Remember that when I was standing yes, when I was still I the champ? Yeah. And Josh was like, he because we knew each other for a long time. Yeah. That's why it was so funny. Jeff, I'm like, oh, hey, buddy, pay attention. Jeff, there's a reason he was named the punk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, his uh, yours was little evil. His was the punk. Oh, bro, I, and I didn't remember the hardship, but I do because you kept mass with you, like ah, and I'm like, man, and you were kind of you were rolling through him. Yeah, until, I was. You until know, that you, moment. You, until that moment. But I'm <laughs> until, saying there's always that until, right? And yeah. but I just remember that because remember we were that close. I'm standing there, Kate side. I might have been. I don't even know if I was. I might have been commentating that one. I don't know because no, I was, you. Were, I, I think you were sitting next to Matt I, Hughes because I remember I looking at you and Matt Hughes. I think Jeremy Horn was there, but there was another okay. guy next to you. And it was funny how you and I just kept talking. Ah, you know, and because yeah. again, people don't know how far back you and I go until yeah. well, they're going to right here. Literally, I didn't. I mean, when I got started, it was you, mm-hmm. and so I'm like, you better pay attention. I never expected that ending, but I was like, I was. You were the one I was waiting. I was like, you were. We're finally going to fight. He's going to beat Eves. And I'm, that's going to be the next guy that I fight, defend the belt. A hundred percent. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. 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 No. Nope. No. Nope. No. <laughs> wasn't I, it? I, wasn't I it? Say, but it was. But the, back to this legitimacy, and all of you guys were coming up, and the, the, it was everybody was to know that I created this weight class, mm-hmm. and that's kind of you know I think people forget about that. And then that was the thing after the belt when I did give up the belt. Now that part. That's why I figured I gave it up a long time ago. Not happening. Not getting yeah. in the Hall of Fame. Not happening. Not happening. Because when I gave that up, like I said, I'll never forget when he said, you know, you're bailing out on us. And I said, I go, I'm not, I'm not bailing out on the UFC. I go, but I truly in my heart believe you bailed out on me. And this, this, this broke my heart. I go, this is, this crushed me, you know, but to see that and then this, then it disappeared for a little while. Mm-hmm. Because Dana, I mean, it was it was BJ and Uno fought for the belt, and it was a damn draw. Yeah, a hundred, you know, and and it this like someone asked, they go, "Has there ever been a draw for a title fight before?" Because that wasn't for the title, though. But it It was was a winner. It was it was for it was to win. See, was going to fight for the vacant title. Dean, that what it was? Okay, Dean Thomas fought Matt Serra. Okay, and in that fight, it was. Matt was announced the winner, and then they went and changed it. Said no, Dean Thomas was the winner. They screwed up the cards or whatever they did, so okay. they screwed that all up. And that was in the tournament. The other part of the tournament was BJ against Cal, and that ended tournament. up being a draw. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it that was they just cut it. It was over. 
Yeah. When it was a draw, he said, "That's it." He threw it up, and he and he and the belt is gone. Boom. Yep. That's, that's it. it. This weight class can kiss my hole. I'm out of here. <laughs> that's exactly I'm it. I'm out of here. And that was it. And I was like, ah. And I was like, oof, oof. And it was, <laughs> oh, it was, yeah. I, I, and as a youngster, I made, yeah. I remember, I remember the comment afterwards. You know, it's uh, it's di- like during that time it was difficult because us we didn't get the respect we deserved. Uh, there was not enough fights to showcase us, uh, showcase us enough. You started the weight class, so it wasn't like the weight class was already there when the sport started. Yeah, there was just so many different things and hoops that we had to jump through to get there. And then when it went away from 2004 to 2006, the weight class was gone. Yeah, you know, then they brought it back, and then that was that Sean Shirk, BJ Penn, Kenny Florian that era of fighters yep. that was there, Joe daddy Stevenson, like yep. those were the guys that kind of brought it back and put it back in the spotlight. And now look at us though. Do you look at it now as being the best weight class in the sport? Oh, I tell everybody it's I'm the Thank godfather you. of the greatest guys on the, on the planet. hundred <laughs> percent. You got Saruki in getting ready. Saruki and I called this fight for, I called it when they fought the first time he, yeah. he fought, he did it on eight days notice and he had to lose. I think it was, and Makachev had, Cut weight, but it was, it's. I tell people all the time, it's the best MMA wrestling I've ever witnessed when it comes to those two fighting. Oh, and their, their, their first phenomenal. fight. Their first yeah. fight. It was yeah. it was MMA wrestling to fight. And, but I said, I go watch. I go Makachev will go on to win the belt, and Sarukian will beat him. And I've been saying this from from day one. So hopefully we're, we're as close as we're getting. But that was my prediction from two years boo, ago. Now, Gamrot, the prognosticator, <laughs> baby. Gamrot, I know, and I'm not saying no, but this I'm just saying because and Gamrot, boy, um, can wrestle. He derailed Sarukian mm-hmm. with that decision. You know what I mean? And don't get me wrong, I love Makachev, and, and I don't. I just the way that Sarukian, just the way that he wrestled, he was just putting it together. I'm like yeah. this kid is something i go he's gonna come back and this was just my pick a few years ago i go and i go i i bet i bet that he, he's the only thing that can beat Makachev, and it, he'd be the only one that can derail him so i'm not saying that he wins it per se but i'm like i bet i was like this kid's gonna he did it on eight days notice i go i bet you he gets back and they fight again and this will be the guy that can beat him that was what it was i was for a while but now we might have that fight coming up or yeah I, I don't know you know it, sound, it sounds like it's going to be in december i think it, whatever the msg fight is it sounds MSG's like so. november okay november, so november so, sounds but like. it goes back to what to what you said but so to me the, and i always tell people the godfather of the 155 pound division as i said i go i love it's always been to me the best the strongest because the also the thing was the pressure and big john can tell you this one we had pressure on us because we were this new weight class we had to have knockout power we had to be everybody had to be yeah. in shape nothing could be boring it could not be boring we we had to be little badgers constantly we had to have all the energy all the power at all the time period and we had to and that's I mean, we had to fight literally fight for our position for our weight class. in the company fight for our weight class 100%. yeah i because i see my, my eves fight with uh with or my fight with eves we were the last <laughs> lightweight we were the last fight uh in the lightweight division until yeah. 2006 so that yeah. fight when i was taunting you in you know and trying to get you to like hey like, we're gonna fight you and i are gonna match up this and that a lot of that had to do with the fact that i had heard they were gonna get rid of the weight class before the fight i heard about it like the it weigh-ins Okay. I was like, hey, they're not going to have the weight class anymore because they were already asking, would Josh go up to 170? And I was like, oh, no. Wow. Yeah, they were already asking me if I would okay. go up to 170 or asking my manager anyway, which was, which was Bob Cook. Will he go up to 170 um, and not fight at 55 anymore? And so there was a lot buzz that they were going to potentially get rid of the weight class. And that being said, I was like, I'm going to show them. I'm going to show them that this is not – that this, this weight class is exciting. This weight yeah. class – it well, brings the action. Yeah, I did. I showed him. And let me just show you, though. Let me just tell you. That was one of the most highlight real well, driven highlight viral things, and they still didn't keep it. So it didn't matter what I did. <laughs> no. It wouldn't have mattered what I did, <laughs> you know? You know? And, but that is one thing now, and I, you were talking about that before, about how big, and people always talk about the UFC and, you know, oh, they need to do this, they need to do that, you know, but what, and I always tell people, you know, you can talk about how big they've gotten now, but nobody remembers Mm-mm. what these guys did, what this group did when they were, like you said, hemorrhaging, they were losing millions, yep. losing millions to keep these shows going, 
losing and nobody where was everybody at then oh ufc give me this give me that and that's why i said you know it was never about you gotta pay it was it was the respect of just somebody getting paid more than me in my own weight class yeah. that just pissed me off and and after i made it through the gambit of those three guys and i'm going there's there, make me the highest paid lightweight by five dollars because i just felt that you know what i mean but i see people talk about that to this day these newer fighters and stuff about oh with ufc they've got all this money they've done that but you know the reality is back in the day when there was nothing they they were suffering they yeah. were on they were going on the end of their ropes they had given enough money like they're intelligent individuals like we're giving we're blowing too much money you know what i mean trying to build this and it's taking too long so the sacrifices that they made and what they did to keep this sport going you know again it was it, it, it was, you know, my hats off to them for everything that they did. And it's just great to see the UFC where it's at. Like I said, you know, the UFC, the 155 pound division where it's at all these little, you know, the fact they could even have smaller fighters now fighting and stuff like that. You know, I mean, and people, cause here's why Josh, I'm getting to it. And people would ask and big John is they say, you know, this day and age, if you were, if you were able to fight right now, do you think you could be competitive? I'm like, I go, number one, a world champion mentality is exactly that, a world yeah. champion mentality. If you, the sacrifices that I made, I can promise 90% of you wouldn't do it. Yeah. You wouldn't fight for videotape. You wouldn't fight for free. You wouldn't pass, give up everything to live on a, you know what I mean, to live in a gym and sleep on a mat. You know, a lot of people won't do that because I know there's thousands of fighters out there that would do that. You know what I'm saying? My but, nutrition program when I started was like top ramen and eggs in the morning. <laughs> what I could you know, afford, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, so a hundred percent. But it's just, you know, anyways. Uh, they, they would they those those fighters part. now, those fighters in this in this day and age didn't have to live through that. I don't know. They I couldn't we couldn't reverse the roles. Yeah. I don't think a lot of them, I'd say ninety percent of them wouldn't do what we did to get to the sport where it is today. They yeah, wouldn't have but, done it. You know, but the one thing to, and to finish what I was saying, because I kind of got I wanted to I, my mind is I get emotional. But it's you guys have one gift that we didn't, which we've been talking about pretty much all the time. You guys get to fight every weekend. I don't even want to hear. Yeah. Could you imagine when we're out there like we were talking about big John, Jeremy Horn and John, we were talking about where we're big um, Jeremy Horn was fighting every weekend. We had to go find shows to fight in. We yeah. had to go find other shows, you know, and that's when, when Dean beat me, I still had a UFC contract. So even though I lost, I still had to figure it out. And I was just, I was in so much pain and I still had to fight John Lewis because I still had my UFC contract. I didn't lose that, you know, and it wasn't in the contract. If you lose somewhere else or whatever, oh, it was in mine, know. it was well, in well, mine. Well, it started getting there. That's what I mean. Yeah. They started wising up and they didn't want you to do that. But I'm just saying. That's the one thing, like the gift that these these youngsters have now, these fighters have now, is every weekend. Yeah, every weekend you can. I'm like, come on, that's just come ow, on. That is awesome. That is <laughs> yeah. awesome. Yeah, we would have fought. We would have fought a lot more. But the thing is, though, too, is I look at it in, in a two way street. I I wish I would have fought more. Strike Force was a smaller show. Like I know yeah. I fought in the UFC, but that was when they only had five to seven shows a year. Then yeah. I go, I fought in Pride tw once, and then I went to Strike Force and fought over there. Most of my fights were in strike force, but it was a smaller show in the States. We didn't travel out of the country. They didn't have as many shows. The UFC was starting to have and ramp up. Yeah. And so what happened was I wish during my time when I was making a ton of money or at least a lot of money at the time that we would have had more shows that I could have fought more often because I would be sitting a lot prettier right now. I mean, I know I'm pretty. I get it, guys. I got the jawline. I got the hair. I got it. I understand. He's got it but all nailed out. I got it all nailed out. Yeah, yeah. But... <laughs> It just comes down to like there some some of these guys are protecting their rankings so much and not fighting that they're losing out on so much money and a chance to just be great. Just yeah. keep fighting. The more you fight, the better you'll continue to get. They're holding on to that ranking so much because nothing's gonna change when you get to be in the champ. Like yeah. you, when you had like if you could have chose somebody else besides BJ Penn, you'd be like, Yeah, I'll take somebody else because you know it would have been a lot easier of a fight. Yeah, BJ I didn't came, want him. yeah, you didn't want him, but you got it. You got it done. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? But there, no one wants it. When you're the champion, you have to fight the best person coming up. And you did that every single time with this, with, with this new generation. Like if, until you become the champion, you have to fight the best guy, but all of them now are trying to handpick, not handpick. They're trying to dodge certain people. Oh, oh they bottleneck. Guy. They bottleneck. They, when they get to that top six, they yeah. like to, they're staying there because they know they're, they're, they're next in line. And we can use Chandler as, as, as a big example. Like that was two and a half years, 
yeah. that he just kind of, you know, two and, and years of his career, two years gone. of his career gone and time. And again, as you get older, like when you're a youngster, oh, time's everything. But when you're towards the end of it, 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 it means everything. You know, it, mm-hmm. it's, again, it's everything. And, but that's kind of where you get hard, we get stuck, especially at 55, 35, you know, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. It, it tends to bottleneck as you get up towards that, you know, the, the top five. It's hard to break into the top five. It is yeah. not too many people want to give up that spot because they know they're the next fight in line for that belt, but that champion's not fighting because, again, they're making enough money nowadays that they don't have to fight every three months or yeah. six months or something, you know, to, to keep food on the table. They can take a time off. And it, so everything kind of gets stuck and nobody wants to give those coming up individuals. It's hard to break in nowadays. You know, back yeah. in the day, it was real easy. Dana was like, you see this fight? Oh, it's exciting. They're fighting. Boom. Yeah. Oh, this guy blew up. They're fighting, you know, or yeah. in the com- promoters, they just want to do that same thing in a smaller show. But now, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough, you know, it, to try to break into that top five. I'm going to leave, I'm going to, I'm going to leave you with this. I wanted to know, cause John and I were talking about this before, you know, you were making a, uh, doing pretty well for yourself doing gaming. Are you still gaming? What's and what's the game? Okay. Well I do game. Um, I do game quite a bit. I, I've just call of duty is giving my computer issues. I don't know why COD activist, you got to put it together, man. You got something going on. It's driving me <laughs> crazy. It just keeps disconnecting. It's dri- I can't, I don't have the savvy, but I do still my Fortnite and stuff like that. I do play the games, but what it did do, building on this computer was it started i started on twitch and i was going to um, i was streaming video games and then one day someone said hey would you watch my fight I'm like yeah sure and so i broke it down and started breaking down the fight and then someone else said, would you hey i got a fight i was doing some sparring would you watch? yeah sure and then the ufc's like hey we're starting a twitch page can you watch can they're like can, you know i remember they're talking to my my uh producer uh sean aak snoo and they're like <laughs> Can they go, can he, uh, like how many fights can he watch in an hour? Like, can he, can he do this? And he goes, really do Jens? Like, Oh, he's made for this. What do you mean? Oh, watch him. So the first time when I, I had to audition to do the, uh, to run the online audition, I auditioned, marks. I, I auditioned <laughs> and, um, I auditioned, uh, yeah, you can't beat me, but so <laughs> the point was I, uh, but I, so I, I went in, I'm like, you know what, since I was never getting in the hall of fame and I, and I couldn't, because these fights are all on fight pass. You can't just stream these things, you yeah. know, like they're not, you know, they're not on YouTube. So like that. So I was like, I'm going to tell the story. So I told the lightweight story of how it was created mm-hmm. fighting in the boss rooting. And I carried it on. I made it six fights, six hours later. I, I finished. And they're like, I go, Oh yeah, I, go, I can do this all day. I love this. I can talk <laughs> all day. And uh, so I did six fights in six hours, told this entire story, talking with chat, you know, and then, so that's, and so that's what I do now is I run, awesome. I do the watch songs. Like I said, Fridays, actually tomorrow we got the uh, Dana White contender series. So nice. I'll be on um, UFC fight pass YouTube. Um, we'll be doing the, uh, the contender series, which to me, these are awesome. Who he's picking. He's done some wildness. You know what I mean? He did it with the wrestler. Hey, with the wrestler, I was, I literally was going, he's going to, bo, he's going to bow nickel him. He's, well, he's going to bow nickel him this time, but mm. I was not expecting him to have the same two fight each other. I was like, oh, oh, this is awesome. You know, so it's pretty cool to see how, you know, who he's going to take, how he's going to take. But like I said, so my watch on partners is pretty much chat. And that is probably my favorite thing because the most important thing throughout all of this and, and getting the name is people giving me their time. Greatest gift on yeah. the planet. You know what I mean? Money can't buy it. We always wish we had more. And the fact they come in and give me their time, I can spend hours. I'll spend six, seven hours doing this, just talking with chat. I love them to death. I, I, nice. it's, I have, I enjoy it more than anything in the world. Plus everybody's always asked about that CTE and are you punchy? I, go, I don't sound punchy. I tend to, I talk as much as I can. I go, look at the way I'm talking. Do I sound like it? You know, uh, I get pissed when I hear that CTE. I'm like, you can see, t- see these nuts. But yeah, no. So, and then like I said, do the watch longs on Saturday. And nice. you know, right now I'm a, I'm a, I refuse to be more. So I'm, I'm a volunteer coach for the high school. My son is going into a sophomore year. And that to me, man, just the ability to stay home and be with my children. This is people always ask, you know, what about coaching and training? I'm like, nah, not yet. Takes away from your time with your kids, which I will not pass up. I will not miss. I will not. I will not. So you and I are the same way, my brother. 
like my my son's uh my son's uh football coach went went out of town for the weekend, so I ended up being like the the coach slash assistant coach. Yeah, you know, for that it was great experience. You know, never coached football before, especially seven v seven, which is like a new thing they're doing. Uh, that and then I don't miss any practices. I don't miss any games unless I really have to. Uh, there's something, my daughter had her first soccer game this last weekend. They got torch seven yeah. zero, but it was still, I wasn't the coach, but it was still, I, I had to say that part. And watch. Yeah, I, I did have to say that part <laughs> because my daughter got in the car and she was, you know, I was like, what happened? How did like, what, 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 you know, what, what's wrong? And she's like, and she just broke down in tears. Just like, I wanted this. I, I, I didn't get to score a goal. And I was like, honey, yeah. they're not going to let you score. She just didn't realize it. Like she thought they were just going to let her score goals. And so, uh, but it was, it was good, man. We had a great experience. And uh, you, if you, if you don't take this time with your kids serious and enjoy it, man, it's going to be gone. Like well, that. that's what everybody always says. They always, where'd get the time back. go? Where'd the time go? You can't get it back. And so no. I just refuse. And like I yep. said, my son, when it was during COVID, when he goes, Hey, I'm wrestling. It was at junior high. I go, what? Yeah. He goes, I'm, I'm, I'm going to join the wrestling team. I go, he goes, did you yeah. used to wrestle dad? I go, Oh, huh? Oh, really? Geez. He's like, Oh, you no. want to see? So I showed Never. him, uh, I Never showed wrest- him some videos yeah. and stuff like that. I go, Oh, your daddy could wrestle. He goes, oh, yeah. really? I go, Oh yeah. Pa- yeah. Dad can wrestle. And so, like I said, then I remember that first time he wrestled, he was going against these club kids and he just got smashed. He got pinned every match. And he just looked at me and he had tears in his eyes. And he goes, are you, are you upset with me? I go, for what? Because I lost? I go, son, no. No, I'm not mad at you. <laughs> it's part of wrestling. I go, this, I go, this is wrestling. This is why I was always trying to protect you. And kind mm-hmm. of, I go, this is, this is a hard sport because it's just you out there. And I go, and that's one of the reasons why I would let other coaches. I, did, I had nothing to do with it because I'm always, I go, if you'll let me be a part of this, I go, I, I, I can help you. But I'm so afraid of, you know, that fine yeah. line of coach, daddy being an asshole. Yep. And, and, you know what I mean? So that's why I was like, but I put him in. I took him right to where all those club kids learn. And I know Trezino, Nick, and all them. I go, here you go, big game. I just, <laughs> boom. And I said, here you are going to learn. So I just stand there. Because everybody always looks at him like, well, you, how come you're not coaching? I go, that's no, my son. It's not good. It doesn't work. But it's now difficult. in high school, now that he's getting older, I ask, I go, do you mind? That I'm a part of it. He's like, no, it, it, of course. He's like, he, he's glad. So I became the strength and conditioning coach. I had to do the FBI background check. I had to do the the, the high school, the college courses, yeah. and do all that, the fingerprinting and all that. And then, boom, I'm a volunteer. But I won't let him do more because that's yeah. all I can give him. Is Somewhere around that age, 11 and 12, is when they start kind of going either they separate themselves from you or they go ahead and jump on the bandwagon. Yeah, like my son's 10, and he just now, I'd say, in the last probably three months. Been, been willing to listen to me more about yeah. like, hey, let's work on this. I need help here. I, I don't understand like what he's talking about when he's talking about his coach saying this or that. So there's a little bit of that when it comes to soccer. When it comes it's to the tough. other stuff, I, I can't give you any advice. I didn't play yeah. those sports. Well, and I overwhelm him because I, it's 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 always in my head. And that's it's hard for me to turn it off. Yeah. And I, Dad, I'm playing video games now. Like it, when it's in the room. It's wrestling, but outside that room, don't talk to him at home about it because he's no, no, no. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, I'm chopping, no. going in. I'm like, all right, I'm out, I'm out. Hey, Jens, man, we're gonna get you out of here, brother. I all appreciate right. you so Love much. You guys. Very good chatting with you all. I appreciate. Good luck on the streaming, man. I'm glad you're doing that. If you guys uh, get a chance, make sure you guys follow along. Hit up Jens. Uh, what's your Instagram handle? Oh, at Jens Pulver. I deleted the big one. Now I have a new one. I'm starting over. So it's at Jens Pulver on Instagram. Best way to get a hold of me. And okay, then, perfect. Like I said, we've got the Contender Series tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, UFC Fight Pass on YouTube. You and go. then Fridays, 6 p.m. EST, we're watching Fights of Fighters Fighting and Saturday's Fights. Nice. Saturday, we do the watch along. So There you go, in. man. I didn't know this, and I'm glad. I'm glad I'm able to, to scoop that out of you. And uh, we'll be, I'll be checking you out now. That's going to be right. awesome, Jens, man. Right. Jens, I want to tell you. I've always loved you, brother. And I've always loved you. I, I, I appreciate all the times that we had together. I want to tell you that watching, not your Hall of Fame induction, but watching the moment when you found out was one of the oh. greatest moments I got to watch. Those ass hats. Oh. It, no, no, it they was perfect. A, they surprised me. It, it was, was perfect. Because you, you know what? You deserved it. We've been saying it for so long. Uh, I meant to and look. you have been an absolute pioneer and you are the godfather of the lightweight division. And I, and I want to tell you, I love you. I love you, Thank my you man. for coming Thank on you. the show, Thank my Thank you brother. both very much. I appreciate you. It's been a pleasure, yeah. bro, man. Yeah, we'll man. talk soon. All right.